Hello everyone, my name is Emily Carton. I work in Antwerp at the university and the university hospital as a PhD researcher. I am very happy to present our recent work on diagnosing somatosensory tinnitus. So of course, tinnitus is very often caused by some form of uh, damage to the cochlea, but obviously the presence and the severity of the tinnitus can be greatly influenced at many stages along the auditory pathway, going from the brainstem all the way up to the primary auditory cortex. And an aspect that is somewhat underappreciated here is the influence that our somatosensory system can have on this auditory pathway. We know specifically that at the level of the brainstem, there are cells in the cochlear nucleus that receive direct input from our somatosensory system. And in fact, in animal research, these primary um, somatosensory projections have been proven. Translating these findings to tinnitus patients, we see that many patients suffer from what is called somatosensory tinnitus, meaning that they experience a strong influence from neck or jaw complaints on their tinnitus. Estimates vary, but right now it's thought that this uh, group contains somewhere between 5 up to 25% of all tinnitus patients. And of course, for these patients, um, it would be reasonable to think that if you treat these neck or jaw complaints, that tinnitus severity would also decrease. And here I want to show you some results uh, from my colleagues that were published last year, where a group of patients with tinnitus and temporomandibular complaints, so jaw complaints, were offered a form of orofacial treatment. And you clearly see that after treatment, um, tinnitus complaints also decrease significantly. And this, um, this was an effect that uh, remained stable over time, also at a longer term follow-up time point. And in fact, we saw that over half of these patients achieved a clinically significant benefit regarding their tinnitus complaints. So it is very much possible to treat these patients with somatosensory tinnitus with some kind of physiotherapy. The problem at this point is identifying those patients. So the diagnosis of these somatosensory tinnitus is very complex at the moment. Um, and in fact, a few years ago, there was a large um, consensus meeting. Uh, there were several international experts uh, present to review the evidence and to agree on a set of uh, 16 diagnostic criteria for somatosensory tinnitus. These 16 criteria can be divided into three groups. First of all, tinnitus modulation, so the ability to modulate your tinnitus sound with certain movements. Second of all, tinnitus characteristics, for instance, um, whether or not the tinnitus sound uh, is very variable. And lastly, accompanying symptoms, which of course include neck or jaw pain, but also tension in the muscles and even teeth clenching. So this consensus meeting was obviously a step in the right direction, but still this diagnosis is very complex and often requires a trained specialist. So we asked ourselves whether it would be possible to simplify this diagnosis of somatosensory tinnitus. And to do this, we launched an online survey um, on the website Tinnitus Hub, which you may know is a very um, popular platform for tinnitus patients online. Um, the survey was launched in September 2019 as an open survey, and patients gave their informed consent um, to use their anonymized data. We included questions on 12 out of those 16 diagnostic criteria I discussed earlier. Um, just for your information, the remaining four criteria are based on certain manipulations or maneuvers, so could not be included in an online survey. And then a whole list of uh, questions on potentially influencing factors such as demographic variables, but also properties of a tinnitus itself or potential comorbidities. All in all, our survey uh, included 24, uh, 42 questions sorry, in total. Um, we had quite an enthusiastic response to this survey. And in the end, our data set contained data from almost 8,000 participants who filled out this uh, survey completely. First of all, we distinguished those participants with somatosensory tinnitus from those without it. We based our decision on whether or not there had been a diagnosis of somatosensory tinnitus made by their physician and whether uh, the degree to which they themselves experienced any influence from neck or jaw problems on their tinnitus. I will quickly already show you the distribution. We saw in this data set that uh, about 10% of all participants perceived somatosensory tinnitus. Next, we of course um, kept about uh, approximately one fifth of the data apart to test our final model. 
Um, and on the remaining training data set, we performed a five-fold cross-validation to optimize the complexity and the parameters of the model. I already showed you the distribution of our data. You can see that patients with somatosensory tinnitus are clearly in the minority here. To account for this imbalance in our data set, we uh, applied a majority weighted oversampling of our minority class, so of the um, somatosensory tinnitus participants. First, a quick note before I go uh, into the results about model selection. We uh, initially planned to use a quite complex model to analyze these data, for instance, something like a random forest classifier. But we fairly quickly realized that we should really be prioritizing interpretability of the model. Uh, and we even agreed that we would be willing to, let's say, um, sacrifice some percentage, percentage points in accuracy in favor of having a model that is very easy to interpret and easy to use in clinical practice. And this is why ultimately we decided to use a decision tree for our specific research question. I will go over the parameters used in the decision tree uh, in a moment, but first I just wanna say that we were able to achieve accuracy of 82% and a very um, well-balanced sensitivity and specificity. Of course, with this imbalanced data set, this is really important uh, to take into account. I'll just zoom in on our most important parameter here. And this was the question of whether tinnitus and neck or jaw complaints increased or decreased simultaneously. Participants had different answering options. If they answered that this was never the case, you see that the probability of somatosensory tinnitus is still fairly low. Participants could also answer that they were not sure. In that case, uh, we needed uh, more answers to different questions further down the decision tree. Um, but from the moment that uh, participants answered uh, that they had this uh, tinnitus and neck and jaw complaints increasing or decreasing simultaneously, at least some days or most days or always, we saw that the probability of them having somatosensory tinnitus really sharply increased. So this was really um, our most important uh, predictive factor. Next, we also included the parameter of uh, tension in the suboccipital muscles with, of course, the higher the degree of tension in these muscles, the higher the chances of having somatosensory tinnitus, um, the ability to modulate tinnitus with certain movements, and the presence or absence of teeth clenching. You can see that especially these two last parameters are really quite far down the decision tree, so they will only be important for a certain subset of patients, and in any case, they're way less important than this first parameter that I discussed, of these tinnitus and neck or jaw complaints increasing or decreasing simultaneously. So to conclude, uh, I think we succeeded in developing a model, a fairly straightforward model with a reasonably high accuracy and uh, maybe even more importantly, a very well-balanced sensitivity and specificity. Um, and this model is very easy to use and also very, um, very quick to use. It only requires four parameters in total. Um, so I think that filling this out for a, a single individual patient would take maybe one minute max um, and is very easy to do. Uh, and you do not require um, an, uh, an, an trained professional, let's say, to do it. Um, so I think we succeeded in creating a very user-friendly and intuitive tool to really aid this um, somatosensory tinnitus diagnosis in the daily practice of the clinic. And for us as researchers, this was also a really valuable uh, lesson uh, about um, adapting your model or tailoring the complexity of your model towards your specific research purposes. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I am, of course, very happy to take questions. <laughs>